So in verses 1 through 3, we see Diana is what we would call today date raped. She was date raped. Or she got into a situation where someone was able to take advantage of her and ended up uh, raping her or laying with her is what the Old Testament uh, calls having a relationship. Jacob uh, did have a daughter. Her name was Diana, the daughter of Leah. She went out of the city of Shechem to find girlfriends. Now, you would think there's nothing wrong with that at all to go out and make friends with people. Uh, we are encouraged sometimes to make friends and not to just stay at home and do nothing. Uh, be more social, uh, be friendly, and so forth. The problem is, is that as, as believers, we need to be careful who we make friends with. The Bible talks a lot about that, that corrupt company will corrupt good morals. And so we need to be careful who we're friends with. And she actually goes into the neighboring cities and makes friends there with girls, but not only girls, but uh, <clears throat> men take notice of her. So Diana, being the only girl, you totally, you totally understand, you know, having ele uh, 12 brothers or 11 brothers at this time, and the only girl, yeah, it's understandable that she'd want some female companionship. According to Josepha, she had been attending festivals, but it is highly probable that she uh, had been often and freely mixing with outside world or society and that she was being seen by those within the community drawing attention to herself by those that uh, were rulers and leaders in that community in her search verse 2 says Shechem the son of Hamor the Hivite prince of the country saw her and he raped her Shechem was we know him to be the, the son of Hamor. Shechem is named after the city because they are in the city of Shechem. And so we don't know exactly Diana's character here. Uh, we don't know if she was in agreement with this. It doesn't say. She might have been in a rebellious state against her parents, strict rules. But the scripture really doesn't say. So we don't know. So we can't really say what her state of mind was at this moment. I remember about, I, I think the last time I taught off Genesis was, was 13 years ago. Uh, we were looking at that 13 years ago. And I still remember the day that I taught this, that someone in the body, a female, came to me and said, how dare you blame her as though it was her fault. And I'm like, I never said that. It was her fault. But it's interesting why that person would even say something like that. Because as I share with you, I'm going to share that she was in the wrong place. And she shouldn't have been there. But that doesn't mean it's her fault and that she deserves what she received. Definitely not. Definitely not her fault. And definitely she does not deserve that. Nobody deserves that. But I think that we need to protect ourselves and protect our children. Verse 3 says, her, uh, His soul was strongly attached, that is Shechem, to Diana. And he was in love. The, the Greek or the Hebrew says, His soul was stuck to Diana. If you understand that vernacular, right? He literally was stuck on her and he could not get his mind off of her. It was all that he could think of day and night after laying with her. And so <clears throat> he spoke kindly to her. Now Shechem found himself drawn to Diana and he does fall in love with her. Uh, date, date rape was a big thing. I don't know if it necessarily is today. I'm not kind of in the loop anymore. That was 13 years ago that I did some research, but um, I remember the research here that I found back in 1999, some of the facts uh, that we find ab about women who will be sexually assaulted in their time. Like back in 1997, uh, 5.4 of college students admit to being taken advantage of um, sexually when they were assaulted and they uh, um, acknowledged that they were under the influence of alcohol or drugs and these were of college students 82 percent of these students who were raped admitted to having consumed those alcohol and drugs not just the other party 60 percent of college age males reported that they would use force uh, in their sexual relationships with women if they were sure that they would not get caught these are just statistics. Here are some of, the, some of the final tips on avoiding date rape. They say avoid parties or groups where alcohol and drugs are used. And that makes sense, doesn't it? 
because you, you, you take drugs and alcohol and, and you have a tendency of losing your self-control and things just happen. These are the things that we tell our kids all the time, at least good parents tell their kids. Uh, I, again, I can remember uh, back years ago teaching on these type of subjects and someone come up to me and says, well, we've got to let the kids, you know, sow their oaks, you know. In other words, experience those life uh, experiences, right? Like if it's a, a, an approval to say, go ahead and do that. And I say, no, why would you want your daughter to experience that? It's crazy. Studies of date rape show that 75% of the date rapes and 55% of the victims had been drinking and taking drugs while they were being raped. Avoid people who make you feel uncomfortable. You get a feeling of this doesn't feel right, something's not, just walk away, get away from the situation. If you're going to a party, establish a buddy system. Have a friend, watch out for each other. These are, these are recommendations. Uh, when you're leaving, don't announce that you're walking alone. Try to walk home with a group or with friends. Uh, don't give a whole bunch of information about yourself to a person. And these are common sense thoughts about how to protect yourself. Don't hitchhike. Those type of things. See, we live in the world. And these are the things that happen in the world. We have Diana who is a part of a new covenant with God. And everything outside of that covenant is of the world. And she wants to experience that world. Whether it is rebellion or whether she's just trying to be friendly, we don't know. But she's trying to experience that world. So my first point is the world. Well, what is the world? The term world can refer to the earth and physical universe that we have. Hebrews 1-2, John 13 very clearly says that. But it most often refers to the humanistic system that is at odds with God. The humanistic system that is contrary to the word of God. That is considered the world. Matthew 18, John 15, 1 John 4, 5. And we'll look at some of those. I'm talking about the system that runs and governs this world. The God of this world who is Satan. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this world is a commandment from the Lord to us. We are not to be conformed to the world system, what they consider to be okay, to put yourself in danger like this. We are followers of Jesus Christ. Christians are members of the kingdom of God, which is not of this world, 1836 says. It's a heavenly kingdom and not a earthly kingdom. Yes, we are on the earth for now, but our heavenly father has made it very clear that we are to live on the earth, but this earth is perishing. It's just but a vapor, James says in 4.14. We're only here for a time, and we are sojourners in this world. We are to focus on eternity. Now, that is a long time. And that is where Christians should really be focused on eternity. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Very clear. We are not to love this world. We're to hold on to the things very lightly. In other words, where our hearts are is a matter of eternal concern. We should be concerned about our eternity and what we are doing. Is our heart in the things of this world? The Bible is clear concerning the spiritual effect our earthly possessions have on us. They should have no control over us at all. We are to master over them. It's not an issue that we can just you know, push away, and we can't push it away as true believers. You know, and I'm looking out there, and I can almost see people uncomfortable talking about this because we do live in this world. And there are enticements in this world. But God warns us to be careful because things like what happened to Diana can happen to us too if we are not. 
So we can't just push these things away as believers. We should be very concerned over these things. Very concerned. The Bible teaches that trusting God involves holding very lightly to the things of this world. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, <coughs> is, not, is not of the Father. God has nothing to do with it at all. But it's of the world. It's of this world. And it shouldn't be a part of our lives. When we are told not to love the world, the Bible is referring to the world corrupt value system. <coughs> what it values in this world. Diana goes out and, and she values a friendship to the world. I value friendships, but I don't value those friendships that will lead me away from God because those friendships will be destructive. And we need to be careful of those friendships. It is a valued system that God is concerned about. Satan is the God of this world and he has his own value system, by the way, and that is do what you want. Forget about what God says. You're your own God. That's what he told Eve in the garden. It's the day you eat of the fruit, you'll be just like him. And you won't have to depend on him anymore. You can do your own things. That is the biggest lie. And yet how many people continue to do their own things according to their own way because they know better? 1 John 2.16 details exactly what Satan's system promotes. The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the boastfulness of pride of life. Those are the things that he will promote. He will promote the flesh. As much as he can, he will promote our flesh in all kinds of ways to keep us away from the Lord or even having a relationship with the Lord. Interesting, you remember the story of Balaam? The Lord just gave me that picture right now. And Balaam's on the mountaintop and Moab is, is saying, how are we going to get rid of those Israelites? And Balaam says, I can't do anything for you at all. God God's, has a covenant with them and he's going to protect them. And then Balaam thought, he says, I know what you can do. I know what you can do. Send a bunch of your young ladies down there. And when they begin to lay with your young ladies, God will have to judge them for their sins. And that's exactly what they did. See, that's getting involved in the value of this world system. Those are the things we need to be careful of. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastfulness of the pride of life itself. We pride, we're prideful in life. <clears throat> Remember years ago, a real good friend of mine, <clears throat> even back then, which is probably about 25 years ago, uh, I would oftentimes say, I'm ready to go home to be with the Lord. <laughs> and I remember him saying, oh, no, I don't, I'm not ready yet. There's so many things I still want to do in this life. And I totally did not understand that, the pride of life. And down the road, he ended up rejecting Jesus Christ as his Savior, the pride of life. I've seen it, guys. I'm not teaching it just because it's our text tonight. I've experienced these things, and the Lord is warning us. Every sin imaginable can be summed up in these three evils, envy, adultery, pride, lying, lying, selfishness, and more spring from these three roots. 1 John 2.17 says, The world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's a promise that we have. Jesus was in the world, not isolated from worldly people, but he was there with a mission. What was his mission? To testify of the truth. He knew that while some would receive him, many others would reject him. And so we're in the world, and just like our Savior, we're on a mission, and that mission is to testify of the truth and to bring as many as we can into the kingdom of God. There is no other mission but that mission. No matter where you're at, you are to be salt. You are to be light. If you're at home, you are to be light and salt in your home. If you are in the workforce, you're to be light and salt in the workforce. If you're out in the community and enjoying the community, you're to be light and salt in the community. <clears throat> we should relate to the world as our Savior Jesus Christ did. 
and to be in it, but to be distinct from it. So Shechem wants Diana now to be his wife. And so he is consumed with Diana. And verse 4 says, he spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, get me this young woman as a wife. You don't see him saying, please, I can't live without her. You don't see him going and knocking on Diana's father's door. Mr. Jacob, I know what happened. I apologize. I'd like your daughter in hand in marriage. Would you approve that? No, he just tells his dad, I want her. Go get her for me right now. Totally in the flesh. This is the world's perspective. Back then, the marriage was arranged. Thank God you don't arrange marriages today, right? Because you would have an arranged marriage. Your parents would get together with uh, a person that arranges marriage, and they would pick out who you would be married to later on in life. And they do that while you were very young. But Shechem is asking his father, uh, the king, to get this young girl his wife. Now Jacob hears of the rape. Verse 5, the rumors are reaching to Jacob. Everyone seems to know about it. He heard that Shechem had defiled Diana, and Jacob became very angry. His sons were in, with their livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came home. He waited until they came home and shared with them what had happened with Diana there. Now Jacob will be able to hold his anger in, but his sons will not be able to do so. And so we see in 6 through 12 that Jacob <coughs> will, Hamar will ask Jacob to allow Diana to marry Shechem. So Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak to him. The sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry <coughs> because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel uh, by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing they ought not to be done. Verse 8 says, Hamor spoke, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as wife and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. <clears throat> if this proposed marriage, think about this for a second, had succeeded, it would have opened the door to more widespread practice of intermarriage with the people of the land. Would you at least agree with that? Definitely. If Jacob would have allowed them, then the sons would have also done the same thing. And in fact, it still happens because of, they act out of their anger and then they take their women to become a part of Israel. <clears throat> and that's not how they should have reacted. But God doesn't want us to interchange with unbelievers, and we'll see that in a moment. Verse 10 says, So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourself in it. Then Shechem said to Diana's father, the brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. I will give. So they're asking them to intermarry with them and become part of their society. We go through the same thing today, and it is such a challenge with the young people to intermarry with unbelievers as believers. And as, you know, as archaic as that sounds, God is protecting us. It is a New Testament teaching, and it's one that we need to really adhere to. This would have completely frustrated the plan of God bringing the Messiah into the world if this would have happened. If you really think about this even deeper, Verse 12 says, ask me ever so much dowry and gifts and I will give according to what you say to me, but give me the young woman as a wife. Whatever you ask, whatever dowry, I'll pay it. He really loves her, really wants her. So we see in 13 through 17, the sons of Jacob offer a devious agreement here. This is where their flesh really takes over. So Jacob's son who was <clears throat> sons who were very upset over this defilement of Dinah devised a solution. So they spoke to Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully. They said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, 
If every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not agree with us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. That's the proposal. Get circumcised. Hey, become like one of us and then we will intermarry and we will exchange in goods and we'll be a prosperous people together and that's how they're enticing them unequally yoked unequally yoked i've been doing this for 30 years and i've probably seen many unequally yoked relationships in this church i've never seen one heed God's word because they know God cares for them and they are children of God desiring to be obedient but I've seen them go on to get married and most of them destroy their relationships because they had not heeded God's word unequally yoked the phrase unequally yoked together is a translation of one Greek word which is a compound word that means to yoke up differently. To yoke up differently. To associate a discordantly or unequally yoked together. It is used only this time in the Bible, 2 Corinthians 6.14. The word yoke means a coupling as when two oxes are coupled or yoked together by a pulling beam to work such as plowing a field or pulling a wagon. To be unequally yoked would be two animals of different sizes, one huge male ox to pull and one scroungy little animal that can't carry its weight. That would be unequally yoked. The one would be unbeneficial to the other one. For us, we would be the strong ox trying to marry something very weak and building it up, hopefully, and praying, and we're going to change them so that they become strong like us, and we're going to serve the Lord and plow the earth for his kingdom. The Bible warns against being unequally yoked. Let's read it. This is the truth. This is what God says, guys. This is what God says to us. I'm not saying this to you. Paul writes, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? First, he starts with the command, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he starts with the questions. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? How can you take sin and purity and mix them together. It doesn't mix at all. What communion has light and darkness? They don't. Now, notice though that Paul says this, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It doesn't say relationships. He doesn't say relationships here. In fact, the context even isn't even really speaking about marriage. He's just saying don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Unbelievers. It doesn't even say marriage. The implication is that of any relationship with another person, if they are an unbeliever, don't get in it. You got a business partner? Is he a believer? Don't do it. Don't do it. He'll take everything you have. It's the first chance he gets. A relationship with another person in a venture that's not a believer? Don't do it. He's going to go through the law and he's going to manipulate it and you both end up going to jail. God gives us this command for our own protection and joy. He knows that we can't have the best possible marriage if we have different belief, values, priorities than our spouse. It's just not going to work. You have enough struggles just trying to become one that you need to have other struggles of faith. And even though obedience to God can be difficult, especially in situations like this, it's always worth it. Some Christians might find themselves saying this, and I've heard it before, but this person will change. I know they'll change, and I'm going to pray for change, and and I'm going to 
teach them to change and, and I'm going to hope they come to church and, and so forth, but they never change. They never do. Listen to 1 Corinthians 7, 16. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? That's a question mark. You don't know that. Why would we put ourselves in that situation in the first place? It's our responsibility as followers of Christ to be obedient to God's command and to trust him for the best possible plan of our lives, even if it means that our lives will go in a new direction. I've only heard of a couple of people that have applied this scripture. And afterwards, they acknowledged that it was a great decision to do. I've seen un unequally yoked relationships with unbelievers just go sour. We have them in the scriptures. What about Samson and Delilah? Samson just loved Delilah, but she was not a believer. And boy, did she deceive him, took everything away from him. Even his long black hair was cut. What kind of woman would cut a man's hair? <laughs> Unequally yoked. A, a, a real life situation. And God had told Samson, you're separate. You've taken a Nazarene vow. Never cut your hair. You're not to touch wine. You're to be separated unto God's glory. And what did he do? He went after some unbeliever woman and got him into trouble. New Testament doesn't list Samson as a failure though, which is interesting, nor his incredible act of strength at all. Hebrews 11 names him in the hall of faith among those who through faith conquered kingdom, administered justice and gained uh, what was promise whose weakness was turned to strength. God is so good to his people. Even when they make bad decisions like being unequally yoked, God will still love that believer. That believer is his and he will still go to heaven. He will still have a relationship with God. And God will watch him go through everything that he had chosen to do on his own, own accord, but God will be there with him. And like Samson, he may do a great work still because of what? God's grace and nothing else. This only proves that God can use people of faith no matter how imperfect their lives are. Notice how many ways Jacob's family could have been unequally yoked here. First, Shechem and Diana, unequally yoked, right? And then now what about Jacob and Hamor in business now in the city? Unequally yoked situation. What about the sons of Jacob and the daughters of the city? Again, more unequally yoked situation. Do you see how it just continues to grow? It would have been the demise of Israel if they would have gotten into those agreements. But if you will not agree with us and be circumcised, they said, then we'll take our daughters and we'll be gone. And so we come to 18 through 24 as uh, Hamor and Shechem agree to the agreement here. Hamor and his son, who loved Diana, were excited about the proposition. So all the young men were circumcised. And the Bible said Shechem, more honorable than all the household of his father. Verse uh, 18 and 19. It was because he loved Diana. Verse 20 says, Hamor and Shechem came to the gate of the city and spoke with the men of the city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will all the men consent to dwell with us as we be one people. And if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, then we will be one. And, and you see his motive there. His motive was materialism. This is a great business transaction. Let's all get circumcised and this will be wonderful. Look at verse 23. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of their country be ours? Le only let us consent to them and they will dwell with us and all who went out of the gate of the city agreed with Hamor and Shechem his son and every male was circumcised all who went out of the gate of the city so we see here that Hamor expected expects to own all that Jacob owns 
because of this relationship. So we come now to verse 25 on the third day when they were in pain because being circumcised causes pain for a few days, especially as an adult. So while they were in pain, two of the sons of Jacob, Simon and Levi, each took a sword and they came boldly upon the city and they killed all the males. That was their plan from the very beginning to wipe them out. Because these men, because Shechem laid with their sister Diane. What should have they had done? <clears throat> what should have they had done? The Bible does give instructions on a situation like this. <clears throat> Just depending. In Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 28, it says, but if, one, it, but if in the open country a man meets a young woman who is betrothed, in other words, she's promised to someone else, and the man seizes her and lies with her, then only the man who laid with her shall die. So he was supposed to die. But the young woman was supposed to stay um, untouched and unpunished because she was betrothed and this man took advantage of her. That would have been the judgment on the individual who raped the woman. So what they should have done was demand the life of Shechem for what he had done, plain and simple, according to the law of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 9 says, if a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed, so she's not promised to anyone, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels, and they shall be his wife, because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all of his days. So uh, you find a young lady. She's not promised. She's a virgin. And as we see in our society today, let, let's go lay in bed. Let's have sexual relationships. As soon as you do that, God says, you now marry her. You are never to get divorced. That is your judgment. That's what should have been done if it was a mutual agreement between Diana and Shechem. Jacob should have said, she's yours, marry her, take care of her, and he should have moved on. That would have been the right thing to do. I've counseled people on this. They've come to church and they've asked. They're pregnant. Go to the court, get married, and you're never to get divorced. That's what the Old Testament says. That's what I did. I didn't even know the Old Testament Virginia was pregnant. I said, we got to get married and we're to never get divorced. We're stuck with each other because we follow what the word of God says. <laughs> but we didn't even know what the word of God says. But that is the reasonable thing to do. Is it not when you do something like that? It's to take responsibility and say, this is my problem. I've created it. And so let me take care of it. How God's Wisdom is so practical for us, and yet we discard it so quickly because we want to do our own thing. So they killed Hamor, Shechem, his sons, with the edge of the sword, and then took Diana from Shechem's house and went out. So apparently they had her there in the house. It reminds me of my own story. God, God always, it's amazing how I fit right into the Bible. I remember when, when, when uh, Virginia got pregnant, we were so scared of her father. Her mom was always very nice, very cordial, never said much. But we were so scared of her father. So Virginia came to our house. I, I kidnapped her, not really, but took her. She stayed there, and then we told the father, and she, I think she actually spent the night or may have spent most of the day there uh, because we, I didn't want her to go there and then be, be given away or you know something would have happened. I wanted to make sure that she you know, was going to marry me. And we did try be under the age of 18, but they wouldn't allow us to. So we had to wait until we were 18 years old. And then we, we got married at age 18. But it's just, it's just funny. I, I kidnapped her, kept her, you know, until everything worked out. And that's what they did. Shechem kept her in his own household. And then they all tried to make these arrangements with Jacob while they kill all the men. And then Jacob goes and they get the daughter and then they take off after they have killed them all for defiling us. Now you notice a couple of things here that Reuben, the eldest, didn't participate. It doesn't say that he did, or even the other eight sons did. And it was, it was Simon and Levi. They are the true blood brothers of Diana through Leah. This 
intermarriage thing doesn't work very well. There's always a struggle there on who's going to lead because the father could not lead. Jacob just could not lead. He had too many sons from too many different wives, and it was a big mess, and so his children were a mess. <clears throat> As parents, we need to take control of our children. We need to not be afraid to tell them no and to start very young saying no because if you just let them go because you don't want to you know upset them or you feel like you're being mean you're not you're disciplining them and you're being a very good parent when you tell your children no don't touch the flame no you don't put things in the socket no you don't th throw things at people you might pluck their eyes out you know those type of things those are good things to tell your children but we live in a society today that says no don't do that because you're hindering them their free spirit, their will, and so forth, you know? And that's what they really want. Again, what, what is the whole purpose? Is they don't want to be told by God what to do, and so they don't want their children to grow up being told what to do either, and they're passing it along to their children instead of teaching them good moral values that we do serve a God that does give us an instruction book that, uh, how we should live our lives, and as believers, we're supposed to follow that instruction book, plain and simple, so they took, so Jacob and, the, and their sons, they took all their sheep, oxen, donkeys, which was in the city and in the field, and then they took all their wealth, and even their little ones, and then their wives. They took captives, and then they plundered all that was in the house. Now, you might say, were they supposed to do that? Now, I'm going to be very careful here. I'm not going to say it's the honorable thing, but I think they were keeping the women and children alive because there was no men. And so they brought them into their household and they would then begin to teach them God's laws and commandments. And so they kept them alive to a certain degree. Verse 30, so Jacob and si Simon and Levi, Jacob says to them, you troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in numbers, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. Now he's forgetting the promise again already, right? Because God's promised him that no one will touch him and that God's promise is going to come from him. But he's a little fearful of the other nations who might hear of this and take it as an insult that they're trying to bully their way around. I shall be destroyed, he says, my household and I. And they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? Dad. I love when sons answer their dads back. <clears throat> shall they treat our daughter like a harlot, Dad? It's a tough place to be. Someone hurts your little girl, what are you going to do? Tough place to be. I know Justin Alfred, who's taught here, his daughter was taken from him. And this guy's a black belt. What is he going to do? And he shared with me, the Lord really had to teach him, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's a tough place to be. But I think Jacob knew that God would take vengeance his way if he just kept the law. His sons just did what they wanted to and went in there and destroyed and killed. And they shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> and then they're blaming their dad. It's your fault. Should they have you know, taken your daughter, our sister, and treat her like if she's some harlot? Come on, dad. Well, they're just being honest. Yeah, they are. I totally get that. But... <clears throat> I don't think that's what God would want us to be doing and how to respond. I know it's a tough place to be. How would you handle that? Well, here's what we would do before it even gets to that. As the Bible says, you reap what you sow. There are consequences to the things we do. And some of us are living those consequences today. And please, don't get so upset because you're reaping what you sow. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. What does that mean? You reap what you sow. Everything that happens to you is a result of your own actions. Plain and simple. Good or bad, by the way. And if you do good, good will come to you. If you do bad, 
bad will come to you. Listen, listen to Galatians where we find that. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows of the flesh will reap of the flesh, reap corruption. But he who sows of the Spirit will reap the Spirit, reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due time or in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially, highlight this if you're, if you're turned there, right? Especially, especially to those who are of the household of God. You sh- if you're doing any good outside, uh, my question to you would be, are you doing good inside the church? To one another first because you should be doing that first before you go outside if we can't do it inside the church love one another then we can't do it outside the church love one another that's what paul was saying to the men who wanted to be bishops if you can't rule your own household then then don't go to the church and try to be a ruler there because it's not going to work first take responsibility in your church first do the things you're called to do first. Well, I go out and I help the homeless and I do this and I do that. Do you support the church first though? Oh, no. Well, then you need to support the church first and then go outside, especially to the household of God first. We are going to sow what we reap. And if you do good, you're going to reap good. And that's wonderful. But if you do bad, the same principle, if you reap to the flesh or sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh Listen to Job. He says it this way. As I have seen those who plow iniquity. So he, he imagines sin as being a plow, plowing the dirt. I've seen those who plow iniquity. Now this is a person that really plows it. This is a person that really gets out there in the world and is doing all of it. Drugs, alcohol, sex, everything. And so trouble, he says. So trouble and reaps the same. You've seen it. Remember Adam and what he reaped? Adam's curse was that the ground would bring forth thorns and thistles in response to his work and that by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Why was that brought on Adam? Because he's reaping what he sowed. But it was the woman, it was his responsibility to be the leader of his home. Adam understood the concept of reap and sow, literally and figuratively. Listen to Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Same concept that Paul uses in Luke. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. How generous are you? And I'm not teaching a prosperity doctrine here, by the way. How generous are you? And God promises that he will give you more. Proverbs 22, 8 says, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. Will reap calamity. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. And and the point of this is, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And Paul's talking about your tithing and your giving. And if you sow sparingly, oh, I only have this much to give, then God's just going to give you a little bit. But the more you give, the more he will make sure that you have to give. Jeremiah says it this way. I, the Lord, search the hearts and test the minds to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds or his actions or his work. God is literally searching for men like that to repay them for their good. On the other hand, there is mercy though, isn't there? There truly is. Not getting what you do deserve. God is a merciful God. God reserves the right to show mercy on whomever he will. As he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And, in, and again, our story with Samson, did not God have mercy on him? He sure did. Though he messed up big time, God still had mercy on him. That's the God we serve. And when we are truly a child of God, a believer who is totally trusting in the Lord and understands the principles of God 
and is living for the Lord. And even though they make those mistakes, God, mercy is going to come down upon our merciful God. It is because of the mercy and compassion of God that we can have a home in heaven despite our own sin. We sow iniquity and corruption and Jesus reaped the punishment on the cross for it. Wow. Do you get that? We reaped. We, I'm sorry, we sowed the iniquity, the sin, the corruption. Jesus reaped the consequences of our sins. Wow. I'm sorry, that's just getting to me right now. <clears throat> Faith in Jesus and the pursuit of godliness is sowing to the Spirit. <clears throat> Amazing that God would take our reaping because of what we sow. Sowing to the flesh depends on ourselves and our ability to find our own way without God's help and we'll reap nothing but dead if we think that sowing to the flesh will save us. But when we place our trust in Christ and reap eternal life, it's because of the work of Jesus Christ because what he sowed was his very life so that we could reap eternal life. Wow. We sowed iniquity he reaped the punishment of our iniquity. He sold good seed and we reap eternal life because of his seed. Amazing how that works. It is so unfair. Why would God do that for us? <laughs> I hear people, oh, I'm going to do this for God. I'm going to do that for God. Buddy, why don't you spend some time thinking about what God has done for you first. What amazing God we serve. His love is fertile ground to sow and reap eternal life let me close <clears throat> the story we have just read about diana and jacob's family serves as just such a warning to every mom and dad wise enough to understand that he who pitches his tent towards the world must not be surprised when his kids act like the world be warned be diligent to raise your children with godly principles. But if you did not, don't be surprised. And if you did not, and you're not surprised, there's still hope <clears throat> like Samson. Get back to worshiping the Lord. Get back to fellowship as he asks us all to do with one another. Get back to praying and seeking the Lord and watch what God can do in restoring our relationships. The parents who say to this child, <clears throat> the way you're behaving, the way you're dressing, the way you're living is causing me to sink. Is almost invariable. The one who has allowed his kids to go places and do things he knew in his heart weren't right. For he, for if we allow our Dinah's and Daniel's to interact with this heathen, world confusion in our kids lives and problems in our homes are surely to follow but if we heed this warning which is so clearly given to us by god dear mom and dad and it's not legalism by the way this is plain old-fashioned wisdom coming from god god will bless your family and your children will be safe. And that's what God wants for us. And that's why he gives us this commandment. Now, can I quickly say this? And maybe you've been following this wisdom. And that hasn't been the case for you. But do you know there is a spiritual adultery with this world? Where you enjoy the world way much more than you enjoy God and his people and fellowship and the work that he's doing in this kingdom. And that is spiritual adultery. And you are unequally yoked with this world as a Christian. And you need to repent and turn back to God and get back to doing the basic fundamentals of Christianity. And that is loving God, fellowshipping with believers, and doing a work through his service. That's the truth. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful story. Lord, a reminder to us, Lord. May we heed this warning, Lord. I, I do pray, Lord, with all my heart, those that are in these types of relationships, Lord, I know, I know I can preach till I'm blue in the face. And I know it's my opinion. And I know they have free will and they will do what they want. But I pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit would take hold of them because I've seen too many sour relationships, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit and your grace would be upon them, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.